Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So I've been talking about tanks in D&D for the last couple weeks and I wanted to talk about them for one more week. Uh, so last week I presented a tank build. This was my personal build that I made that I thought would be an effective tank. Today what I wanted to do is highlight someone else's build for tank builds. This is a build that is very different than the build I made last week. What this build really reminds me of is Iron Man. If Iron Man was a D&D class, this would be that class. But before we do that, what I want to do is thank some of my patrons. I have a Patreon. If you are interested in checking it out, check the video description and you will see a link for it. But today what I want to do is recognize some of my Archmage level patrons who really help out this channel. And specifically today, I want to recognize Joseph Robodeau, Geek Dice, Dewey Cheatham and Howe, Nick Lutz, Henry Eleveld, Scott Ballantyne, Matt, and Dave Peters. Thank you all so much for continuing to support my channel, and thanks to all my patrons who help me create my content and support what I do. But for today's video, I'm going to be presenting a build. Once again, this is not my build. This build comes from a user on my Discord named Ronin. Now, Ronin is known for creating a lot of optimized builds, and he tends to do a couple things all the time. He tends to use variant humans, and he tends to use Hexblade. This is no exception. So this build today will be using Hexblade and Variant Human, and it is called the Force Lance build. And this, of all Ronin's builds, is my personal favorite, and that's why, with Ronin's permission, I am presenting this build to you today. So let's get started. Now the first thing I'm going to mention is this is definitely a build that you want to talk to your DM about before you play it. And the reason is is because we use a, an interaction here that is perfectly legal within the rules but probably not as the rules are intended. Specifically we are combining the feature from Polar Master that allows us to make an opportunity attack when a creature enters our reach when we are wielding a polearm and the Warcaster feat that allows us to cast a spell when we make an opportunity attack. Being able to use this combo is perfectly legal within the rules because the Polar Master feat doesn't say that you have to use the polearm to make that attack of opportunity. However, that's not necessarily the intent of the designers. Now, Mike Merles once answered this question, whether Polar Master and Warcaster combine to allow a magic user to make a spell opportunity attack when they enter reach, and Mike Merles said, no, Polar Master applies only if you use the weapon it lists to make the attack. That isn't true. The fact is, is the rules don't say that at all. Uh, but Jeremy Crawford answers this more accurately. He says, the intent is that any opportunity attack triggered because you're wielding a polearm is then made with that polearm. Uh, now, this has not been errated, so the rules don't support this intention. But that was the intention of the designers. And if we're going to go against the intention of the designers, we need to have a conversation with our dungeon master first. Now, I am a dungeon master quite often. And when players come to me with ideas for characters, my general ideas are, number one, is this going to be fun for the player? Number two, is this going to be a problem for my campaign? And number three, is this going to interfere with the fun of other players? And if the answer is, it's going to be fun for the player, it's not going to be a problem for my campaign, and it's not going to interfere with the fun of the other players, I usually say yes. So if somebody came to me with this build and asked if it would be okay to play, I would say yes. However, I'm not your DM and I don't speak for all DMs. So you need to talk to your DM. And if they say that if you get an opportunity attack triggered because you're using Polar Master, you cannot cast a spell even with the Warcaster feat. You must attack with the Polearm instead. Then this isn't the build for you. This build relies on that interaction. On the upside, the Force Lance build doesn't use a lot of sources. It uses the Player's Handbook, it uses the Sword Coast Adventures Guide, and it uses Xanathar's. So as mentioned, the race we're going to be using is the Variant Human because we want to get that feat at level 1. Now with our ability score increase, I'm recommending the increase of Constitution and Charisma. Now there's a decision we're going to be making very soon with our ability scores where we might actually want to choose Strength and Charisma, and I will discuss that at that time. 
For skills, the skills that Ronan recommends are either Athletics or Arcana, so I'm going to choose Athletics. And finally, the feat we're going to select is Polar Master. This does two things for us. The first is, when we make an attack action using the Polearm, we can use a bonus action to make a second attack, and it does D4 plus our Ability Score modifier. And the second is, while we're wielding the Polearm, when a creature enters our reach, they provoke an Opportunity attack. These two things are going to give us a very needed offensive boost at low levels. And if you are not using a Variant Human and trying to make this build, you're not going to be able to meet baseline damage at low levels. Now the first level of this character is going to be Fighter. Uh, and the proficiencies we're going to take are Perception and Intimidation. And we're going to select the Dueling Fighting Style. And we're going to get the Second Wind Ability. So the Second Wind Ability, of course, gives us a Self-Healing option. Again, the selection is important in regards to the fighting style. Dueling is necessary for this build. Uh, now, if you want to choose different proficiencies, you can totally get away with that. Now, Ronan doesn't say specifically how we should arrange our ability scores. This is how I would probably arrange them if I was playing the build. I'd do a Strength of 14, Dexterity of 10, Constitution of 15, which becomes a 16, dump Intelligence and Wisdom, and take a Charisma of 15, which becomes a 16. At least with a point by, that's how I would arrange it. Now there is some reason why we might want to arrange it differently. Number one, we could reverse our Strength and our Constitution. So we have a 16 Strength and a 14 Constitution, just by changing our beginning racial modifiers. Now the advantage of doing that is twofold. The first is, at first level, we will do more damage if we have a higher strength. And the second reason is, once we get into armors heavier than chainmail, we will have a reduced speed if we don't meet the minimum requirements of that armor. And the minimum requirements of those armors is 15. So by putting a 14 strength here, I am basically putting my character at a 20 foot movement rate once we get to higher levels. Now I think that's not a huge price to pay because this build actually doesn't require much in the way of movement. In fact, the tactics of it largely involve not moving. So I think we can get away with the strength of 14. But if you wanted to have that 30-foot movement, then you can either switch your constitution and strength, or we can take our dexterity and dump it right to 8, and we could get that strength of 15, which would meet the requirements of the heaviest of the armors. So we have a number of options here. This is the way I've gone with this build, but if you wanted to go either with a strength of 15 or a strength of 16, totally doable. Now the background for this build is not specified, so take whatever you want. Determine what skills you want to use with this character, select the background that's going to get you those skills, and then you're going to get tool proficiencies or languages. Now the starting inventory you want to have for this character is chainmail armor, a shield, and an arcane focus we can use as a quarterstaff. Now again, this is something you want to check with your DM. The designers have said that you can use an arcane focus staff as a quarterstaff, but a quarterstaff is a specific kind of staff, and an arcane focus staff is a specific kind of staff, and nowhere in the rules does it say that one can be used as the other. So this again is up to your DM, and if your DM is not okay with it, you know what? we're still fine. There's not that many spells that have a material component that we're going to need to be able to cast while we're holding our weapon. So it's probably not going to cause you a problem, but it makes things easier if we can use our arcane focus as a quarterstaff. And at first level, this is a dead easy build. We're going to be using our quarterstaff, get opportunity attacks when creatures enter our reach, and we're going to be making two attacks on our turn. One with our action, one with our bonus action. Our armor class is strong at 18, and our hit points is strong at 13. And although with this build I didn't bump up my strength to 16, we are still delivering over the baseline damage. What I want to do now is go through the various things we do to get to level 5. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take two levels of Hexblade. This gives us a number of nice things. So obviously first, our otherworldly patron we're going to select is the Hexblade. Uh, this is going to give us an expanded spell list that's going to include Wrathful Smite, and we're going to be taking Wrathful Smite right at this time. Hexblade's Curse is usable once per short rest, and it's going to increase our damage against a single enemy. It requires a bonus action to use, uh, but when we kill that enemy, we also recover some hit points. The next thing it does is it gives us Hex Warrior. Now, if we had a 16 strength, 
Hex Warrior doesn't really make much difference to us. But because we have a 14 strength, it makes sense for us to make our staff, our hex weapon, and then we can use our charisma for attacks and damage. Finally, we're going to select two Eldritch Invocations, and we're going to select Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast. These two things are going to make our Eldritch Blast an effective long-range weapon for us to use. And they are absolutely essential to how this build plays out. We are going to select two cantrips, and the cantrips we're going to select are Eldritch Blast and Green Flame Blade. Green Flame Blade is something we're going to get a lot of use out of at low levels, probably aren't going to use it anymore at high levels, and Eldritch Blast is something that we're not going to get a whole lot of use at at low levels if we can get into melee range, but at high levels we will be using it all the time. And we will be selecting two first level spells. Those spells will be Hex and Wrathful Smite. Hex is something that we are going to rely heavily on at low levels in order to exceed baseline damage and Wrathful Smite is something that we can use later on as a way of controlling the battlefield. Wrathful Smite is actually a great spell for tanks because it imposes the Frightened Condition to a creature that we hit with an attack and that creature, once it has the Frightened Condition, can't approach us anymore. And that Frightened Condition is difficult to get rid of. They have to use their action to try to get rid of it. So as long as we can maintain our concentration and we've hit somebody with a Wrathful Smite, it's a pretty effective way to control the battlefield. Now if we do want to use Wrathful Smite at these lower levels without falling below our damage threshold, we can still do that, but it's going to require using our Hexblade Curse instead of Hex as the way of boosting damage. And then once we do that, then we can use Wrathful Smite and we can still maintain above the baseline damage and still get our control aspect from Wrathful Smite. Now we're actually going to get one additional first level spell and it doesn't really matter what you want to select. I always like the shield spell, but with the amount of spell slots we have, we're just not really going to be able to use shield very much yet. And we're going to be taking shield later, so that's not an issue. Personally, I'd be inclined to take Armor of Agathis, because this is a character that's going to have higher level spell slots than levels of spells, and that's usually when I want to have Armor of Agathis. And then for our final two levels to bring us to level 5, we're going to go back to Fighter and take Fighter to level 3. What this will do for us is, number one, we will get Action Surge. Now at lower levels, our best bet with Action Surge is just to do another attack, probably a Green Flame Blade, or maybe a Booming Blade, which we're going to be taking right away here. Later on in this character's progression, we're very seldom going to be using Action Surge to actually attack. So we're going to be able to take two cantrips, and the cantrips recommended are Booming Blade and Light. Light because this character doesn't have dark vision, and Booming Blade it just gives us another option, especially with our Action Surge, where if we find we can get the secondary damage with Green Flame Blade, great. Uh, if not, Booming Blade, we might get secondary damage from that. Then we're going to select three first level spells. The spells we're going to select are number one, Absorb Elements, number two, Find Familiar, and number three, Shield. Now, Absorb Elements and Shield kind of fill similar roles. They are reactions we can take when we would be taking damage as a way to either mitigate or avoid that damage. And the reason why Shield's a lot better now and Absorb Elements is a lot better now is we now have a lot more spell slots. Uh, with Warlock, we only have those two slots, but now that we've added Eldritch Knight, we have two more slots, so we have double the slots, and two of them come back on every short rest. So it is much more conceivable now that we might cast a shield or an absorb element spell. Now find familiar specifically, it's going to give us the help action on our turn, and so on our first attack each round we should have advantage. So what happens with our damage per round against the baseline, uh, and to those who are unaware, I use a baseline to measure damage. The, the baseline is kind of just a uh, measure of damage that I kind of figure a character that is supposed to do damage should be able to do at each level of progression. And any build video I do, I always compare against the same baseline using the same assumptions for number of rounds of combat, for the use of limited abilities, etc. With the Force Lance, what we see is at level 1, we are above the baseline. Now, if we had gone with the 16 strength, we'd be significantly more above the baseline than it is here, as in above 10. But you can see that even with the 14 strength, we're comfortably meeting the baseline. 
Then at level two, we see a big jump. And the reason we see a big jump is number one, we're using our charisma bonus for both attacks and damage. And secondly, we can add the hex spell. Now, when we use the hex spell on the first round of combat, we can't use our bonus action attack from Polar Master. So on the first round of combat, when we set up our hex spell, that's when we wanted to use either a green flame blade or a booming blade in combination with that hex spell. Then on rounds two and after that, we're going to be using our Polar Master for a bonus action attack, except on rounds when we need to change the target of the hex spell, in which case we're doing the same thing. We're gonna change the target of the hex spell and do a green flame blade or a booming blade. Now I often get asked why there's a dip in DPR at level four, and if you look here, you can see the Force Lance does have a dip in DPR, and that's because at level four, I assume a higher armor class when I'm doing my calculations. So if you don't increase your primary ability score at level four, you'll see a little bit of a dip, and that's what we see here, but we're still comfortably above the baseline. Then at level five, we don't add extra attack with this build, but what we do add is a second attack with Eldritch Blast. So this is the time where we want to switch from using Polar Master to using Eldritch Blast. This gives us two advantages. The first advantage is that we are now using D10s instead of D6s and D4s for damage. But the second advantage is we can attack twice with Eldritch Blast and it's not using our bonus action. That means our base attack is never going to interfere with the placement of a hex spell, for example. And as we can see, from levels one through level five, we're comfortably above the baseline, not going crazy or anything like that. Uh, and this character has a couple spell options. Most of the time, it's just going to be dealing with Hex and maybe an occasional Shield and Absorb Element spell. Now, I want to talk about level 9 specifically. So for the next four levels, what we're going to do is we're only going to take Fighter. So Fighter is going to go to level 7, going to keep Warlock at level 2. And 7th level fighter is going to give us a couple different things. Number one, it's going to give us two ability score improvements, and we want to take feats for both of these. The first feat we're going to take is Warcaster. Now, Warcaster is going to make our concentration basically unbeatable. We're already proficient in constitution saving throws, and we have a very strong constitution score. Add on that advantage on saves when we take damage, and concentration is just not going to go down. Second thing is we can perform the somatic components of spells even when we have weapons or shield in one or both hands. Very useful for this build because we are using a shield and we're using an arcane focus. And it is a common misconception that you can perform somatic components if you're holding an arcane focus. That's not the case unless the spell also has a material component. But when we're talking about the various spells that have verbal and somatic components only, including the shield spell, including the absorb element spell, you need to have your hands free. And we can't have our hands free with this character because we need to have our pole arm out so we can get those opportunity attacks when creatures enter our reach. And then finally, when a hostile creature's movement provokes an opportunity attack from you, you can use your reaction to cast a spell at the creature rather than making the opportunity attack. So what we're going to be doing now is when those creatures move into our pole arm range, our staff range, we can now use a green flame blade or a booming blade against them. And then with our second ability score improvement, we're going to take the crossbow expert feat. And the reason we want to do this is because our opportunity attacks become so much better if we take the crossbow expert feat. And the reason is because instead of doing green flame blade or booming blade with opportunity attacks, now we can do eldritch blast. And because we are eldritch blasting more than one beam, that's like getting extra attacks with our opportunity attacks. And this is a character that takes advantage of a lot of opportunity attacks because of Polar Master. In addition, because we have Repelling Blast with our Eldritch Blast, we can often take advantage of even more opportunity attacks. And I'll go over that a little bit more in detail. The other thing this character is really getting that's fantastic is War Magic. This is an ability I normally consider to be okay. But on this build, it's really good. Beginning at 7th level, when you use your action to cast a cantrip, and that's what we're doing our action on all the time, because we're using Eldritch Blast. We can make one weapon attack as a bonus action, and unless we are placing or replacing a hex, we have our bonus action available, and now we can hit things with our staff. And because our Eldritch Blast can be cast in melee range without any penalty because of Crossbow Expert, we can go into melee, we can hit things with Eldritch Blast, and then we get our bonus action, we can hit creatures with our weapon. So what this ends up meaning is, 
our character can attack twice around with Eldritch Blast, and then once around with our staff. So that's three attacks around, plus if the, we get an opportunity attack, we get an additional two attacks. So we might be making five attacks in a round. If we use an action surge, we might be making seven attacks in a single round of combat. And we get extra attack, and this is one of those cases where you're taking five levels or more of fighter, and you're not even really using extra attack with this character. The suggested first level selection for this character is Magic Missile. I don't think you're going to use Magic Missile a lot, but I will mention that if you upcast Magic Missile against a creature that you've done a Hexblade Curse to, it can actually add up to a fair amount of damage. And we're going to get one second level option, and because we're limited to Evocation and Abjuration spells, there's not a lot of great options. The recommended option is Darkness. Now, Darkness still can be a pretty good tanking spell, because if we are facing spellcasters, a lot of spells require that you are able to see your target, and Darkness can prevent that. Now, once we get to this level, we actually now have second level slots. We have two second level slots, and we have six first level slots. Two of them recovered every short rest. So we now actually have a fair number of spells and a fair number of spell options. Do we always want to be concentrating on Hex, and that's going to prevent those spell options? Do we always want to be using our Action Surge for more attacks when we could be using our Action Surge for other kinds of spells? And the answer to the, both those questions is no in my case. So what happens if we drop Hex? What happens if we drop Action Surge in terms of using it for attacks? Well then, our damage per round looks like this. As you can see, at level 5 we're well above the baseline, and at level 6 we even increase that difference. Level 7 we maintain it, and level 8 we increase it again. But, once we get to level 9, we have second level slots, we have a lot more spell slots, and we have a lot more spell options. This is the point when I want to start using my action surge to cast spells, rather than just attack with it. So if I give up on both those things, naturally I'm going to see a significant decline in damage. But if we look, we can see that we still maintain above the baseline damage, even without doing those things. And the thing is, is if damage is what I want to do, I still could do those things. If I do those things, then my damage is going to still be well above the baseline. But by having it down here, it just gives me more options, and I'm still delivering effective damage every round. And I really want those options, and I want them even more coming up now because we're going to go into fighter level 8 and fighter level 8 is one of those cases where suddenly I want my action surge for spells. The first nice thing about fighter level 8 is we're going to get another ability score improvement and finally we're going to start increasing our charisma. Uh, so we were at a 16, we're now at an 18, means plus 1 to hit, means plus 1 damage with both our Eldritch Blast and our staff attacks and it means that any spell we cast at an enemy has a DC of one higher as well. But also importantly, at level 8, level 8 is one of those levels where the Eldritch Knight can select a spell that is not from the Evocation or Abjuration School. So we can choose Mirror Image at this level. This is exactly the spell I want to be casting on round 1 using my Action Surge, because it's going to just layer up those defenses. This character is going to have a good armor class, but Mirror Image plus a good armor class makes this character extremely difficult to hit. To get this character to level 11, we're now going to take a level of Sorcerer, and the Sorcerer we're going to be taking is the Divine Soul Sorcerer. This gives us Divine Magic and Favored by the Gods. Divine Magic, of course, is going to give us access to Cleric spells as well as Sorcerer spells. With our regular spell selections, it's also going to give us an additional spell at first level, and in this case, it'll be Bless. Bless is a great spell for this character and a great use of an action surge. And then Favored by the Gods is a great way for this character to make some of those saving throws that they might not otherwise be able to make. This character does not have great dexterity saves. This character does not have great wisdom saves. Favored by the Gods can give us that boost so that we can make those saves when they're very important. Speaking of which, Bless can as well. We're going to get four additional cantrips for this character. Of course, we have a ton of cantrips with this character. So the recommended ones here are Guidance, Lightning Lure, Mage Hand, and Message. I think Guidance is still going to come up reasonably often, but I do think you can take whatever you want here. It's not really going to make a difference to the build. The recommended first level selections for this build are Healing Word and Shield of Faith. I'd say Shield of Faith is the more important of those two. 
This character can really build up a really big armor class, especially with Shield of Faith. And often with Shield of Faith, part of the problem is, is when you do get hit, then often your concentration goes down. But this character is not dropping concentration very easily. So that Shield of Faith is a pretty much straight plus two AC. If AC is what we want, if we're not worrying about using spells to control the battlefield. And what it looks like when we look at the damage is the damage increases and the difference between the baseline damage and the force lance increases again as well. So at level 11 again, we're not using hex, we're not using any spell that increases our damage and we are not using our action surge to increase our damage. And even in those cases, the damage is well above the baseline. And defensively, this character is really picking up. Assuming by level 11 we've had a chance to get plate mail, we should expect a base armor class of 20. Assuming no magic items, with the shield spell we can get that to 25. Good chance we can get above that if we have some magic items as well. But where this build really gets into play is once we get crossbow expert. This changes everything. Our Polar Master Tax of Opportunity become Dual Beam Eldritch Blast with pushback and eventually Triple Beam Eldritch Blast with pushback. And so getting near us becomes really difficult and painful for our enemies. Let's assume for a moment this front character is our Force Lance. And this is our enemy, whatever, generic enemy. And on the enemy's turn, it decides it wants to attack our Force Lance. We're never going to charge the enemy. We're going to let the enemy charge us. And this again is when I talked about the difference between using plate mail with 20 foot movement or going with the 16 strength and I said this character doesn't need to be overly mobile. This is what I mean. We're waiting for enemies to come to us with this build. And so this enemy comes to us and what are we going to do? Well, it just provoked an attack of opportunity and because we have Warcaster, we can cast Eldritch Blast, so we're going to hit it with a couple Eldritch Blasts. At level 11, we're going to hit it with three Eldritch Blasts. And what are we going to do when we hit it with Eldritch Blasts? We're going to push it back. It may be pushed back 10 feet. It may be pushed back 20 feet. It might even be pushed back 30 feet once we get to level 11. But regardless, there's a good chance now that this creature is going to lose their ability to attack us on their turn at all. Now they're stuck either trying a ranged attack, or maybe they're going to take the dodge action, or maybe they're going to dash to get to us. And if they do so, that doesn't help them either, because then on our turn, we're just going to attack them with Eldritch Blast again, and we're going to push them away again. And even if we only hit them once, then it's all reset. If they want to come at us again, we're going to get another opportunity attack against them and do the same thing again. This is going to end up controlling the battlefield and delivering a lot of damage to the enemy. So these are the three classes we're going to be progressing the rest of the way with this character. And I'm going to take it to level 17. Levels 18, 19, and 20 really aren't important for this particular build. You can take them in more levels of Sorcerer. You could take some levels of Bard if you want. You could increase your Warlock levels if you want. They'd all give you certain advantages, but none of them are essential for this build. You could take three in anything you want. But the next four levels we're going to take with this character are all in Sorcerer. This means at level 15, this character is a 5th level sorcerer, so this is the first point where we are going to get 3rd level spells. We're going to get sorcery points, we're going to have 5 of them at this point, and we're going to get 2 metamagic selections. The 2 metamagic selections we're going to take are Twin Spell and Quicken Spell. Quicken Spell is probably more for use with Eldritch Blast to give us more damage boosting. And our ability score improvement will be for Charisma, that gets our Charisma to 20, so now we have the best possible to hit rolls, the best possible damage, and the best possible DC for our spells. This character is going to get an additional cantrip, and take whatever you want. It is recommended that you take Feather Fall for this character, and switch it out at a later point. It is also recommended that you take Prayer of Healing with this character, and switch it out at a later point. Uh, now, I don't know if I would take Prayer of Healing, but it's not my build. Two spells that we are going to take that I think are going to be very nice on this build are Misty Step and Web. Web, of course, gives us something to concentrate on. It also gives us another method to control the battlefield. And controlling the battlefield is part of tanking. And this character can stand right up front, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big enemies, and still use control spells like Web. 
And Misty Step is really nice for this character too, because if you think about the tactics that I was talking about before, being able to Misty Step in or out from enemy's reach, and the fact that we're using a totally versatile weapon with Eldritch Blast, really gives us more options. Then as previously mentioned, we're going to be swapping out Feather Fall and Prayer of Healing. We're going to be picking up Hypnotic Pattern and Spirit Guardians. These are two of the greatest third level spells in the game. Both use your concentration. Now, Hypnotic Pattern is one of the best con mass control spells in the game and still good at 15th level. Spirit Guardians is great for upcasting, so if we want to use our 4th level slot, which we have now, this is a good way to use it. And Spirit Guardians is what I would use if I want to increase my overall damage, because, of course, we're delivering damage every round. But we are also controlling movement by having enemy movement. And remember, because we are pushing enemies away and they've got to come in to us, that have movement can be problematic for them. Because they come in, they take the Spirit Guardian's damage, then they finally get to us using double movement, then we hit them with an opportunity attack, we push them away again, and then they have to come in again, they've already used a lot of their movement, and then their movement is halved again. And there's just so little chance they'll be able to get to you and attack again. And with our final two levels to bring us to character level 17, we're going to take them in Fighter. So at level 17, this is primarily a fighter. We've got just a little bit of Warlock and a moderate amount of Sorcerer, but out of 17 levels, 10 of them are fighter. Fighter is going to give us Indomitable. That's another way that we can take care of saving throws. So if we miss a saving throw, if we're close, we might use Favor to the Gods. If we're not close, we might use Indomitable. And then if we make another save and it doesn't work, then we might use Favor to the Gods at that point. We're also getting Eldritch Strike. I really like Eldritch Strike on this character. This again is not something that's always easy to use with an Eldritch Knight. But when we hit a creature with a weapon attack, that creature has disadvantage on the next saving throw it makes against a spell you cast before the end of your next turn. So if we hit a creature using our bonus action attack granted through the War Magic feature, then on the following turn it's a good time to throw a spell on that enemy because they will have disadvantage on their saving throw. We're going to get one more cantrip. The recommended one is Prestidigitation, but again, it, you have so many cantrips, it really doesn't matter. Uh, and then we're going to get one more spell selection, and the recommended spell selection is Protection from Evil and Good. Generally, I consider Shield of Faith a better defensive spell overall than Protection from Evil and Good because it's useful against any enemy. Protection from Evil and Good is only good against Aberrations, Celestials, Elementals, Fey, Fiends, and Undead. Now, a fair number of combats will be against one of those kinds of creatures, so we will have both options. We have Shield of Faith, we have Protection from Evil and Good, and in the case where we have these kinds of creatures, Protection from Evil and Good will actually provide us more protection. It does require our action to cast, though, meaning that this would be something we would cast with our action surge. But the big thing that happens at level 17 is our Eldritch Blast is now firing four times. This means that on our turn, we can probably attack five times if we use our bonus action as well. Now, a standard fighter at 17th level is attacking three times. Uh, we're attacking five times, and we're not using Action Surge. And if we get an attack of opportunity, and we will get a number of them, that five becomes nine attacks. If we do want to use our Action Surge, we can get 13 attacks. And what ends up happening with our damage is we end up very comfortably above the baseline, right from levels 11 through level 17. And level 17 is the biggest gap of all. We're almost doing 50 points of damage around versus a baseline of about 35. And this assumes we're not using Hex. This assumes we're not using Spirit Guardians. This assumes we're not using our Action Surge for extra attacks. If we do any of those things, we can boost our damage per round well over 50. And that's what I like about this build, is you really get to choose. If you want to do things like control the battlefield with web spells and hypnotic patterns, you can do all that and still be really good with damage. And our defense is strong too. We have a great armor class with this character. But if we want to focus on damage, we can do that as well. And we can do the spells that increase our damage potential. And instead of doing just good damage, we can do great damage. So we have some flexibility there. We can play the role of the striker. We can play the role of the tank. We can do them both pretty effectively. And we can kind of bounce back and forth between them as the situation warrants. And that kind of flexibility is something I really enjoy when I play. And that's why I really wanted to talk about this build.
And if you would like to check out this build in detail, or any other of Ronan's builds, you can check them out in my Discord community. I'm going to post an invite in the video description. Feel free to come by and say hello. So next week on our channel, we're going to be talking about Eldritch Knight spell selections. We just made Eldritch Knight, and one of the things that comes up and questions I get quite often are, what do you do with Eldritch Knights in regards to spell selections? Because you do have limited options. You can only select Evocation and Abjuration schools for most levels, but you do get a couple options that don't need to be from those schools, and we're not always dealing with a strong intelligence score. So how do we make the best selections? So that is the topic of next week's video, and until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone, and we'll talk to you next week.